Thanks so much, Dean. Um, there is a wealth of information, let me just say up front, on our website, tmea.org, that speaks to the impact of rigorous art study on test scores and uh, SAT and all of those things. So in my five minutes, uh, I'm not gonna try to go there. Um, Dean did ask me to say a few words, though, about collaboration at the state level. I've never opened any comments with a Webster definition, but I am today. Collaborate means to work jointly with others, especially in an intellectual endeavor. Thought that was interesting. Well, collaboration is a beautiful thing, and I know we all know that, but it's difficult to quantify, and it's difficult to measure. In the political arena where I hang out a lot at the Capitol, collaboration of educators is critical for our survival. And I'm pleased to say that in my 18 years of hanging out at the Capitol, working together with TASA, with TASB, with the principals associations, with the teachers associations, with the uh, nonprofits, Texas Cultural Trust, uh, Commission on the Arts, uh, Coalition for Quality Arts Education, uh, they've all been critical to our success in terms of our collaboration. Admittedly, teachers associations sometimes get a little crossways with school boards and administrators, probably an understatement, and disagree on some issues. But the truly critical legislation that directly impacts how we serve students, we all ultimately end up on the same page. The end result is, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but as a result of the efforts of all of us at the Capitol, Music, art, and theater is required to be taught in grades K through five, standards-based. Every student in grades six, seven, or eight must take at least one fine arts course, standards-based. And of course, every graduation plan, including the minimum, uh, requires one credit of fine arts to receive a high school diploma. This past year, over 1.5 million students in secondary school, grades six through 12, were enrolled in a fine arts course. Our legislature and our state board have recognized the importance of arts education in providing a well-balanced education for children in Texas schools, and certainly for that, we're grateful. And just Wednesday, I was in an event at the Capitol and met Commissioner Williams, our new commissioner, and I'm thinking good things. Um, uh, he's, in many ways, I think, going to be very supportive of our efforts. Fine arts educators, to me, head the list in collaboration on any campus, but this weekend, our discussion, as you're well aware, takes the collaboration to another level by partnering educators with community arts organizations and expanding it throughout the curriculum. I'm sure many of you saw uh, the Edutopia article on the internet two or three weeks ago. Our fine arts administrators in the state have been bouncing that link around. It's about a middle school in Maryland, Bates Middle School, and it talks about the successful arts integration program that's going on there and how, as one science teacher said, with the vast majority of my students, I am truly facilitating big chunks of their learning by focusing them on diverse artistic expressions of their knowledge. And certainly the experts are gonna be here today to share the beauty of how all this process comes together. In the recent College Board publication, that was a supplement to the Phi Delta Kappen magazine, I think I, I got mine this week. Students and teachers talk about reform and student engagement in school. Here's what students said. Give us options as far as projects go, so that people who are more academic oriented have options and people with more of a creative side can do a project that isn't just writing an essay on a book. The top three priorities for students for, in terms of engagement, make it fun, interesting, and entertaining, so I want to come to class. Two, make it relevant. Three, tailor it to my needs. Teachers' top three priorities, students must feel valued, learning must be connected to something they care about, and three, instruction must be paced, challenging them without frustrating them. And the one sentence that resonated with me that sums it all up, students crave variety in instructional technique 
and they consider it part of a teacher's job to make learning engaging. Certainly collaboration through the arts addresses, I think, all of the priorities of both students and teachers. In the words of Dan Pink, who's been quoted many times in these kinds of events, we need to make sure we're preparing our kids for their future and not our past. What I see in business is a premium on novelty, nuance, and customization, yet I fear schools are going exactly in the opposite direction. They are increasingly about routines, right answers, and standardization at precisely the moment that the economy is no longer about those things. So hopefully our discussion today will take us in the direction we need to be going. And I certainly applaud you for your presence and for your district participation in this pathway for collaboration. And the person to set the mood for that transition is our keynote speaker this morning. Um, Tim told me at breakfast, don't read all that stuff, so I'm not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Tim is a trusted friend uh, to anyone interested in working with young people in developing a desire for excellence and a passion for high level achievement. He went to, uh, taught at a bunch of universities, he has a bunch of degrees, so I won't read all that. But Tim is on the road most of the year honoring requests for workshops, seminars, and convention speaking engagements, focusing on the area of positive attitude and effective leadership training. Over three million students have he experienced his acclaimed student leadership workshops over the past three decades. Personally serves as, he presently serves as Vice President of Education for Con Selmer and continues his rigorous travel schedule, touting the importance of arts education for every child. I always say Tim is the Pied Piper. This is not in his resume. I always say Tim is the Pied Piper for music and arts education in this country. He's truly our rock star for promoting and communicating the message of the importance of the arts in every child's life in this great country. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser. Thanks. Uh, it's, trust me. Whoever's on the lights, can I get the house lights up all the way? I, I'm a drummer. I'll go to sleep here in a little bit. Uh, yeah. Ah, thank you. Take them wide open if you can. Thanks, Bobby. That, that's great. Bobby's like my little brother. This is, first of all, this is so cool that, that you did this. And, and when they called and they said, would you do a keynote address for this? I, I went to Webster as well. I don't know if you know what the, here's what it says. It's a presentation of substantive material delivered in a scholarly fashion. I just told you I was a drummer, so the chance of this happening is like the Astros getting in the World Series or something. I don't think there's a prayer. Um, I, for those of you who are academes, uh, and, and I live in that world, I still teach at four universities, but I, I'm not a researcher, I'm, not, I, I, I'm a teacher, that's what I do every day. In fact, I remember telling my dad, I said, when I grow up, I want to be a music teacher, and my dad said, you can't have both. And so I went ahead and opted, <laughs> I went ahead and opted to do this, and it's been the greatest life in the world. Uh, I do a lot of administrator leadership things, Bobby and I were talking last night, and, and when I get to do music, when I get to music conventions, I always start out by saying, every child should have music every day in school taught by a qualified music teacher. Now that links me pretty closely to those people because it's part of their survival. So I was doing an administrator thing a few years ago and I thought, well, let me throw that out. They never tell them I'm a music teacher, you know, it's just like somebody who does leadership. So I said. I started, I said, every child should have music every day. And you can just see the crowd kind of, <clears throat> ouch, like that. So at the break, this, this young uh, assistant principal came up uh, and he said, uh, interesting opening statement, which means I'm going to argue with you. And I said, yeah. He said, you think every kid should have music and arts every day in school? And I said, absolutely. And he said, but every kid's not good at music and arts. I said, you teach math at your school? <laughs> you, you know where this is going, don't you, right? <laughs> And he said, uh, absolutely. And I said, well, every kid's not good at math. And he said, but they need math to live a better life. Now, that's just an alley-oop, isn't it? You just want to <laughs> smack that one out of the park. 
And, and I think 10 years ago, I would have argued with him. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, are you familiar with the information, the data that's going on about the brain development over there? And he wasn't. Really sharp young man. Got his email address. This was three years ago. Been giving him information, sending it back and forth. He's added three arts teachers to his faculty. Yeah, so we're making progress here, one at a time. Those are the arts teachers that just clapped. Um, uh, how many, of you, how many of you were involved in the arts in your own uh, school programs as you grew up, okay? How many, how many would say this? You may be in this room because of that arts teacher. Okay, and you wonder how powerful you are. It's amazing. I, here's the whine I hear from educators, and I'm one of you, by the way. Here's the whine I hear. But Tim, you don't understand. I'm only one person, and I can't make a difference. And the truth is, the only thing that has ever made a difference is one person. The question we probably should ask ourselves is, what kind of difference am I going to make because we're going to make a difference. It's just what kind of difference we're going to make. Now, for years we have said, you know, all the smart kids are in music. That's why their test scores go up. That's why they're so successful in college, blah, 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 blah. Then a few years ago, they started to look at it and they said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. When we put kids in music, that's when they start to academically rise. So to not dispute, but at least to take a look at this, in our little uh, community of Elkhart, Indiana, where Con Selmer resides, that's the home of band music, by the way. Did you all know that? Mr. Con, he's the one who started school band programs. They took, they went into the, to the school system and they said, we have a thing in Indiana called I-STEP, which means you have to pass this test to be able to go to the next class. They said, give us 100 students who have not passed the I-STEP test who are you know, in desperation, if you will. So they did, and they said, can we have them an hour a day, every day, for a year? And they said, yes. So for one semester, that hour a day was on drum circles. They had little drum circles going. Then the next semester, those children got to choose, did they want to play an instrument? Did they want to be in a choir? Did they, did they want to do piano? Or did they want to do like technology music and so forth? At the end of the year, they tested it. And I have the research if anybody wants it. They tested it. 98 of the 100 passed their I-STEP test. 18 of them went to advanced level. Okay, now was this just an alignment of the stars? Was this just an accident? Was it, was it like the, the, the study they did in 2004 at Michigan where they took students who were not part of music as up to the eighth grade, they put them in music as a freshman year. At the end of the freshman year, their academic scores went up 11%. At the end of the sophomore year, up 14%. Junior year, up 17%. And for some reason, during the senior year, it jumped to 26% academic increase. OK, was that an accident? Is it true? Are all the smart kids in arts, or does art make them the smart kids? So there's all the evidence is now shifting around like this to make, a, to make it look as though really what it does is open up that side of the brain. There's such a huge difference between knowledge and wisdom, isn't there? Do any of you, do any, I mean, come on, we have administrators in here. Do you have any have teachers in your school that are really smart but aren't good teachers? Let me see, I'm just interested. <laughs> that looks like a majority of the crowd. Does, 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 I mean, and you go, what, how can you not connect that to a child? Or, it's, or it's, as, as Robert said, is, is it relevant? Does the child understand it's relevant? So here's just a, a clip version of this. There, there are about 200,000 brain cells that we're born with, about 200,000. Now, I'm a percussionist, so I'm down a few thousand, but I, you, you can compensate for that. What, what we now know is you can actually grow more brain cells. That wasn't evident until 2002 when they got an MRI machine strong enough to watch the brain work. We, it's all been theoretical up to this point. You can now grow more brain cells. And until then, we thought that everything you learned was in there somewhere. So every time I'd forget something, I'd go, dang it, it's in there, I can't get it. Now we know, if you can just picture this in your mind, here's a brain cell, here's a brain cell, here's a brain cell. When they're connected by dendrites or mind maps, that's intelligence. Those mind maps disappear. How many of you took, I don't know, chemistry in high school and got a decent grade in chemistry? How many couldn't pass that test right now if your life depended on it? Okay, where did chemistry go? Where did it go? Or for those of you going back to graduate school, they retest you on everything. Like what you learned didn't make any difference. And I always just thought I was stupid. I couldn't remember it. Now, here's the good news. And this is stuff that we want to we put our arms around. It's not 
that we don't, it, that mind map is still there. It's just not fertile. You gotta, you gotta put water, add water, shake it or whatever. And it'll come back very fast. Anything we learn that has to do with arts, particularly music, the, and we don't know why, but the mind does a thing called myelinate and it puts a coating around that mind map and it stays for almost ever. Now, if I can remember, right? You finish this for me. N-E-S-T-L-E-S. -E what do they make? Now we know who the old people are in the audience. Because <laughs> that, that has not been on television for 28 years. Now these are people that can't balance a checkbook, but they can sing that goofy thing. It was right there, wasn't it? It was right there. You didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to go, no, wait, Nestle's. Oh, my God, what is this? No, it was just there. Winston tastes good like a How long has it been since there's been cigarette commercials? The mind goes, there's the information. You know? You, what, what was my telephone number before I moved? I don't know. All right? Because it's not relevant. Now, here's the good news. Okay, so that mind map that you just demonstrated, you can take that same archetype and set it on science and math and English and history and everything else. That's why those kids are doing so well. They got an incredible network. They've got an infrastructure that they can put on top of everything. So if nothing else, and please, please, I want them in arts because of arts. I don't want them there because it raises their SAT scores or because, I, I, but that's selfish, Tim. But if that's a spin-off benefit, let's take it. Let's do it. I mean, if I were administrator and test scores were important to me and I had some arch teacher ramming those things up, I'd be pushing kids in that class. I'd get them in there. Now, here's the question for you. Does every child have the propensity to make music, yes or no? Yes. That's another new finding. We always thought it was just for the talented ones. Everybody's talent, talented. But if we don't trigger that by about 10 or 11, we know that part of the mind begins to purge itself. It says, you're not going to use me, might as well lose me. And it starts to push down. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't do it after 10 or 12. What it means is it's much more difficult. Up to that point, the creative mind is very fertile at once. OK, so let's keep standing back. How are we going to get a win-win out of this? We, we, we need to get those academic grades up. We want those test scores up. I mean, just to be real honest, you, you want to cancel your honors program, shut down the arts. It'll do it just like that. Because those are the same kids. Those are the ones, you know, we keep teaching people what to think instead of how to think. Now, to do that, though, it's just like Mr. Floyd said. We're going to have to make some changes. We've got to look at things a little bit differently. We can't keep doing what we've done. Changes are hard. The human creature is a pattern creature. It hates changes. We like habits. So somebody begged me to do this. Let's do these habits. Take your hands and put them together like this. Now, let me ask you something. Did you have to think about that? Did you consciously have to go, now wait, what's he doing? Okay, I've got it. No, you just did it, didn't you? See if your left thumb's on top or your right thumb's on top. How many had your left thumb on top? How many had your right thumb on top? Okay, which is the correct way? <laughs> and the tendency is to go what? My way, right? Where's my left thumb, people? There's no research on this, so don't get excited. <laughs> You're supposed to be romanticist. You're creative people. You're good lovers, if, the, if you will, right? <laughs> now, don't change, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Just, just relax. So my left thumb people are the good luck. Now, how many had your right thumb on top? Okay, you're cognitive people. You're good thinkers. You have really good analytical thinking skills. So the left thumb people are going, oh, it's a sunset. It's a gift from heaven, right? <laughs> And the right thumb people are going, it's refracted light through dust. Uh, that's where you get the colors changed, right? So you got, you got your good lovers and your good thinkers. Now, did anybody do it like that? Did you? That means you think you're a good lover. If you do, you put those two together like that. Don't, don't write that down. Okay, now, take your hands apart and reset your fingers the other direction. And how does it feel? It feels awkward. So the human creature says, I don't want to do this. Let's go back to the way it feels good. And that means we don't have to change schedules. That means we don't have to change parking places. Let's, it's good enough the way it is. 
No, it's not. No, this is fun. Take your hands apart. The minute I say go, clasp them together as fast as you can. Go. How many went the old way? Majority of the room. The majority of us go to these conferences. Don't worry. This is the way I make my living. Go to these conferences. We'll get all the information. We'll get kind of jazzed about it. Walk out and go, yeah, let's just go back to the old way. You know, let's just let's keep going to that church. I don't particularly like the minister. The sermon's not that good, but we know how to go in. We've got our season tickets on this pew, and it's just it's good enough the way it is. Right? I just I just love these things where you can actually engage. Take your hands, put them like this, one up, one down, where you fold your arms. Put put one hand up, one hand down. See if the person beside you is like you or if they're different than you. That's interesting. Okay, now look up. Okay. And just kind of shake them just so you get a new start. Okay, now reset them the other way. <laughs> see, it's hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> and you see people going like, oh, what the crap is that? <laughs> so the easiest thing to do is simply go back and go, well, it's worked this way. I'm good enough. I can get it. I mean, come on. Any baseball fans in here? Any baseball fans in here? Who, who's more valuable? Right-hand hitter, left-hand hitter, or switch hitter? Switch hitter. The person who could do it both ways. Who's the most valuable in our administration? The person who's cognitive, the person who's affective, or the person who's affective and cognitive? Both. If we can't take cognitive and make it affective, then why do we do cognitive in the first place? If there's, if there's no why to the how and what, why do we do the why in the first place? And nobody wants to say it. It's like the emperor has no clothes. And then you, get, you see the kind of evidence that Mr. Floyd's bringing and that some of my friends out here live with, and you go, that is so obvious. I mean, we all have anecdotal stories. I can tell you forever how this kid was a nobody, got in the choir, and became a neurosurgeon or what. I mean, there's just, there's tons of that stuff. But now we have empirical research that shows this. Okay, we, we, we're going to have to make some changes. Now, then why don't we want to make changes? Because there's always a learning curve. From intention to outcome, there's that bridge of learning curve. So here's why it shows up. Would you take your hands and clap like applause really loud, really loud, really loud? No, 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 no. That sounds like a golf match. I want it, I want it really loud. Go, go. Good. I want you to do it again and listen to it this time. Go, go. Good. Whichever way your hands work, turn in the other direction and listen. Go. Go back the first way. Switch. I rest my case. We're not good at something the first few times we do it. And so the tendency is to stand back and go, uh, uh, let's don't mess things up. What's that lady said the other day? I've heard you three or four times. I said, how's it working? She goes, not very well. I said, I said, well, are you happy? She goes, well, I'm not happy, but I'm not, I'm not unhappy enough to change. That's ridiculous. We're a creature of choice. And the, one of those kids that's in a choir, a band, in the school play, that's the kid that's going to cure cancer. That's where it's going to come from. It's going to come from that creative part of the mind. Now. It, there's some ridiculous thing that says, but if we give them time doing that, they won't have time doing this. And it's just the opposite. When they do that, it makes this better. When the tide goes up, all boats rise. And I think there's that, that fear of stepping over into that. So I, you know, I look at people who, I mean, really are huge researchers. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the book, uh, Music with the Brain on Mind. Eric Jensen's a great researcher. And he, he set out to prove that there was a myth about all this art stuff. He spent two years in research going, it doesn't make any difference, they're all just you know, supporting their own needs and everything. And he came out 100 degree, 180 degrees on the other side. He said, the evidence suggests that musical arts are central to all of learning. The systems they nourish, which include our integrated sensory, attentional, cognitive, emotional, and motor capacity processes are in fact the driving force behind all other learning. This doesn't mean that you can't learn without the arts. Many have. But learning with the arts provides more opportunity to develop these multiple brain systems, none of which is easy to quantify due to the nature of the process. So it's, it's hard to measure it, except when we use the template that we use for everything else, and all of a sudden, those scores just go up on kids. Um, I don't know about you. I, there's a huge responsibility. That kid gets one car wash from first grade through 12th grade. 
And if it doesn't hit somewhere during that, it's not going to hit. Because we know by about 26, most of our habits are pretty well set. You're not going to change the way you do this, by the way. It's just a silly game. You know, but watch this. Would you take your right hand and reach as high as you can? Thank you. Now would you reach one inch higher? Good, put them down. How'd you do that? How did you do it? I said, reach as high as you can. The whole room goes clunk. I go one inch higher and you go, okay. <laughs> it was a choice. And if I'd have kept punching you, somebody would have stood up. Then somebody would have tried to get on a chair or something ridiculous like that. And we would have kept reaching. Um, do any of you know the name Eric Wainemeyer? Eric Wainemeyer is the first blind guy to climb Mount Everest. And the six other highest peaks in the world, by the way, including the one in Antarctica. I had a chance to, to, uh, to speak with him uh, in Italy a few years ago. To follow that speech! <laughs> and, you know, and here's a guy, blind guy, and it shows him in Time magazine on the top of, of Mount Everest, the summit of the world, and now a drummer's going to talk to you. I mean, I, oh God, just a small heart attack is all I wanted. So afterwards, I mean, I love people who achieve at high levels. I just go now. And I went up to him and I said, I'll give you any amount of money to have lunch, dinner, anything. I just want to talk to you. Really nice young man. He was 38 at that time. Now, oh, well, you have to come to my hotel room to get me because I can't get I'll do it. I'll do it. And, you know, I got so <laughs> excited. I'm talking to him. I let go of him. And I'm looking around. And he ran into a plant. I'm like, oh, my God. Here you go. Here you go. Come on. Here we <clears throat> now, he Now, the stuff that you and I do, we don't have to think about. He, I mean, he struggles with, I had to read the menu to him. I had to, here's your iced tea and all this sort of thing. So at the end, at the end of the conversation, I said, how did you do it? How'd you do it? He goes, how'd I do what? How did you get to the top of Mount Everest? And he's just laughing. He goes, oh, that's easy. No, 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 no. People die doing that. Most people don't make it. How did you? He goes, Tim, I'm telling you it was easy. Okay, then scoop me. How'd you do it? You ready for his answer? He said, I kept putting one foot in front of the other. And then he was reaching, he was reaching for, like, and I put my arm out, and he put a death grip on my arm. He goes, hey, Tim, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Oh, ouch, that hurt. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Would you embrace all of this information? Would you integrate it into every day? Would every kid have a child to exp a chance to express himself or herself in a language that's universal? What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And I just, I stopped. And he goes, oh, Tim, he said, just, I'm just teasing, which he wasn't. He said, and I said, it just astounds me that you pulled this off. He said, I probably shouldn't tell you this. But he said, when he got the top, he said, I didn't even know we were at the top. I was getting ready to take another step. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, they grabbed me, and they went, look, we made it. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> he said, it looks the same to me as every place else. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What would you do? And I asked him, because I, I was so cold, I said, Eric, I said, Weren't you scared? He goes, I couldn't see. There was no risk, right? There was no risk for him. I mean, the rest of us, oh my gosh, what? Him, he's just putting one step in front of the other. Taking knowledge, creating wisdom. Now, please understand, as I said, I am a storyteller. I still tell stories. This is, this is the loudest one that ever happened for me. How many of you have ever lost a parent? Um, you know, they passed away or whatever. I, I, I don't care how prepared you are for this. I mean, it, it's a kick, right? So I, I don't want to use my dad's passing as fodder for my, but if you knew my dad, he'd say, go ahead, you know, Tim, you got a chance to turn a buck, do it. Um, <laughs> he's a good guy. He's my best friend. I'm an only child, so Pops and I were pretty close. Uh, uh, and just stay, indulge me here for a moment, because it shows the difference between smart people and wise people. And I think sometimes in education, we make them smart, and we need to make them wise. Um, his end of his life, he starved to death, which was a, a, a horrible death. His body couldn't process food. And I watched a man that was about 280 pounds go down to just uh, under 90 pounds. And, but he was lucid the whole time. So we come, he's in the hospital, and they got him all in machines and everything. And I asked the doctor, I said, can you tell when we're getting to the end of this thing? And he goes, yeah. And I said, would you tell me about four or five days out, and then I'm just going to cancel all the stuff I'm doing, and I'm going to hang with my dad in the hospital room, and I said, my, my father's not going to pass away alone, and my mother's too old to stay here. Oh, he said, Tim, that's nobody. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, we'll set up a little desk for you in his room, and he said, then 11 o'clock you can leave, and then you can come back in at 7 o'clock in the morning. I said, whoa, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to live with him. I want to stay with him. Well, he said, we have a rule in our hospital that you have to leave at 11 o'clock at night, and you can't, 
Now, rules are made for people that can't think. That's why we have rules, you know. Try, try to get something in McDonald's that's not on there in the actual thing, and nobody can think enough to actually put, you know, chicken and beef together or whatever. Anyway, so I said, well, that's a stupid rule. Change your rule. He said, well, it's not up to me. He said, it's up to Amy, the head nurse. I said, you're the doctor. He said, I'm scared of her. Um, <laughs> he said, she pretty much goes by the book. He said, well, I'll, I'll go ask her. So he comes back and he goes, she's, she's not going to bend on this. So he said, I'll tell you what, you just stay back there in the corner and don't cause any trouble. No, I'm going to run up and down the hallways and pull out people oxygen cords as this, what are you talking about? He said, I think she knows I'm cheating. So he also told me, he said, when your dad gets towards the very end, he'll think he's hungry. I said, he hadn't been hungry for four months. He goes, it's the body's last reach for life. So it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm sitting there banging around my computer. And Dad would go in and out of this consciousness. And all of a sudden, he said, Tim. I said, what's up, Pops? He said, son, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, I'm hungry. Uh, he said, that's good news, isn't it? Sure, Dad, that's the best of all news. He said, uh, is it day or night? I said, doesn't make any difference. What do you want to eat? He said, how about some ice cream? Ice cream it is, Pops. He loved ice cream. I go running out of the room. I'm three steps out, and I'm just, <laughs> that's what I said. I don't care how prepared you are for it. it it's the end. Now, I'll try to find ice cream at 2 o'clock in the morning in a hospital. I dare you to try to find a nurse. So anyway, I, I ran down to a local 7-Eleven store. I got the Ben & Jerry's double chocolate, his favorite. I, come back. I even ran up the stairs. I didn't take the elevator. And as I'm running to his room, guess who's on that night? Amy, the witch nurse, is on. <laughs> Amy, I've got to be right about everything, and you're wrong about everything, nurse. So as I'm running through the hall, she goes, you! And she backed me up against the wall, and it was, you're not even supposed to be. And I'm thinking, ma'am, we can do this later, please. So I finally got away from him. I ran in. I'm just hoping Pops is still alive. And I said, Dad? And he goes, yeah. I said, you know what's going on? He goes, yeah. Did you get the ice cream? <laughs> I said, I sure did, buddy. Now, he's a skeleton now. He's a refugee. And I get him all lifted up. He goes, hey, Tim, put my glasses on me. I said, well, what do you want your glasses on for? He goes, I just want to look at you, son. All right. Whatever you want, Dad. And I said, easy does it, buddy, because we haven't had food for a while. I mean, it was probably the reverse of when he fed me, huh? Right? Alpha Omega. And I put that up, and he went, oh, he said, Tim, that tastes good. I said, you can taste it? He goes, yeah, he said, it's sweet and it's cold. He said, you take a bite. Why? He said, it'll be like we're having a father-son party. Oh, way to go, Pops. You're always thinking. And it was... It was as close as two men could ever get. I mean, I was, I was next to him. I was him. All of a sudden, I don't want to insult the women in this audience, but you have a certain stance that just scares the crap out of men. <laughs> and I felt her behind me, and I turned around, and there she was, and I could see horns and fire coming out her mouth. She goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm feeding my father ice cream. Now, I'm not making this up. She goes to the end of the bed, grabs his chart, and goes, cease immediately. He's not to have sugar. <laughs> Ma'am, are you nuts? You've got enough morphine in this man to float an aircraft carrier. And it wasn't about the sugar, was it? What was it about? It was about control. Amy had to be right, and she had to make everybody else what? Wrong. She said, if you don't quit, she said, I'm going to call the doctor. And I said, well, you go, girl. And she left, and Dad and I knocked out the pint of ice cream together. <laughs> Next morning, the doctor comes in. He goes, hey, I got a call last night about 3 a.m. I said, she called you? He goes, yeah. He said, isn't she the most hateful you ever met in your whole life? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, what is the story on that lady? He said, we've had her in every corner of this hospital. He said, she ticks off everybody. I said, fire her. You ready? He said, we can't. She graduated first in her nursing class. Her grandfather's on the board of directors. He said, we would have every lawyer in the world on us, so we just keep moving her around. About an hour later, Dad says, I want to go home. Well, Dad, you can't go home. You're all hooked up to life support systems. I said, we pull those things out. A couple hours, you're gone. 
He just laughed. He goes, Tim, I'm gone anyways. You think I can't hear what the doctors say? Take me home. Your mom won't do it. Please take me home. So I track down the doctor. He wants to go home. And right away, I start getting medical jargon. Well, you can't because... Stop. Let him have the dignity of dying at home. He said, well, Amy's got to check him out. Oh. <laughs> I said, I'll talk to her. So I got her, and boy, she arched that back, and we... And I said, Amy, I appreciate the fact that you're probably smarter than everybody else in this whole hospital, and certainly smarter than me. But you got two choices, sweetie. One is you get an ambulance for me. We'll get him in it and hope we can get him 15 miles down the road into his own bed. If you say no, I'm going to carry him out of here, and that's going to kill him for sure. Now it's up to you. And I just drew the line. And she acquiesced. And we took Pops home, and we, we put him in his bed, and we pulled all of his old cars up so he could see him. And he just gently went to sleep. Now, here's my point, and there is a point to this, by the way. My point is this. Was Amy right? Yeah. Oh, you bet she was right. You put that in front of any lawyer, and I would have been put in prison. She was right. Was she wise? No. No. See, Amy was never in a band. There's your problem. <laughs> Amy should have been in an arts program somewhere. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not trying to be silly about this. I mean, look at the opportunities that lady missed when she walked in and goes, what are you doing? You know, well, I'm, I'm having ice cream with my dad. Good grief, Tim. Give me your phone. Let's get the lights on. Let's get a picture of the boys together. I'd have given anything for that photo. See, there's the difference. There's the connection right there that arts do. Now, it doesn't soften people. If it comes between being right and being kind, let's choose kind. We can always go back and be right, but we can't go back and be kind. Positives come and go, negatives accumulate. Yes? So when we step back and go, what do we want for the landscape of the future? What do we want for the, what's going to happen in 2000? We want people to get along. We want there to be civility. We want there to be a sense of harmony, a concert in the world, if you will. And the one place that happens, the one place that we all understand are the arts. And again, we all have the anecdotal stories about it. But when we stand back and look at it, it's incredible what can happen. So, I, I mean, I think the fact that you're even here together, I mean, that is so cool. I'm serious. Because you've got busy days. And what we do is we take our time on busy things. Don't worry, me too because we know how to do them. Those are the comfortable. We know how to do the busy things. But to stand back and just say, create. Great leaders create what isn't. Managers do things right. Leaders do right things. So when we can create what isn't and connect to the dream, now we got something. And I don't want the flag to drop and impossible dreams start playing here. I'm just telling you that when you look at great leaders, it was always about a dream. Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a plan. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. And you know what? 240 some thousand people met on the quad at DC to hear about that dream. And that was before email existed. And 45% of them were white to hear about the dream. Kennedy didn't know how we were going to get to the moon. He said, I have a dream. And when somebody puts that up, all of the engineering people of the world come around and said, we'll make your dream come true. So, you know, we, we've got such an incredible opportunity. It's interesting. You know, pessimists always see the challenge in every opportunity. Optimists always see the opportunity in every challenge. You know, it's not what we think we are, but what we think we are. So when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And my gosh, if in this world of technology, what a chance for artists. And we're all artists to bloom. So this is the last thing, and I'll get out of your face about this. You're fun. Um, how many of you ever, do, do geese fly over here? You, you allow geese in this country? OK. How many of you ever watched geese fly over? How many have ever noticed they're in a V? In a V? Now, how many have ever noticed this? That one leg of that V is longer than the other leg. Have you, have you observed that? Does anybody know why? There's more geese in that leg, and that's what pushes them back further that way. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to be a physics person to get that. 
Now, let's take this in, in, in the context of animals operate on instinct. Even though we operate a little bit on instinct, we still operate on choice. What makes humans different is we can stand outside ourselves and watch ourselves and make a choice. This, I just love this. When geese fly in formation, each bird flaps its wings, creating an uplift for the bird following it. By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% more flying range than if each bird flew alone. Is that cool? I think the good Lord knew what he's doing on that one. He said, you guys got to go a long distance? Here, let's set you up like this. You can go a lot faster. Whenever a goose moves out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and the resistance of trying to fly alone, and it quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. Smart goose, huh? When the lead goose, that's you, gets tired, it rotates to the back of the formation, and another goose flies to the point position. The geese in formation honk from behind to encourage those up front to keep up their speed and strength. You're like, ah, 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 ah. You know, it's like, go, Fred. Ah, ah. And Fred's up there. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> when a goose gets sick or wounded, two other geese drop out of formation and follow the sick one down to the ground to help protect him or her. Then they stay with their fellow goose until he or she is either able to fly again or dies. Then they launch out to find another formation or catch up to the original flock. It's so apparent. When we fly together, we can go so much faster. So the idea of a collaboration is a strengthening of everything. Now, I want you to watch this happen. Because when, when we look at support, you know, it's the old frogs trying to crawl out of the water thing where one keeps pulling everybody else back in. And then we all pull back. Let me ask you something. How many of you think your academic curriculum, your community, could do better? Just out of curiosity, how many think they could do better? Good. How many of you think you could do better? I appreciate your honesty. How many want this to be the best year ever? Well, who's not going to hold up their hand? He's going to, no, we'd like to deteriorate this year. <laughs> Our standards become substandard. No, come on. How many think for things to get better, something has to change? I appreciate it. How many think what has to change is something you can purchase? How many think what has to change are the people? And who are the first people that have to change? Us. Yeah. So I want to watch this. I'm going to divide the room in half right here. Just lean one way or the other. OK. Must have been how Moses felt, right? So <laughs> all right. I want to go to this half o a room over here. I want to ask you something. Could we have done what we did for the last 45 minutes if they hadn't cooperated? Yeah. No. The truth is we all got to move forward because this half of the room said, we'll get, we'll get on board with you. I'll give you five seconds to acknowledge him for doing a good job. Five. Four, three, two, one, stop. Pretty good. Watch what's going to happen. This half of the room over here, could we have done what we did for the last 45 minutes if they hadn't cooperated? I'll give you five seconds to acknowledge them. Go. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Now, they upped the ante a little bit, didn't they? Now, isn't there a part of your human that triggered and went, Duh! if we had another opportunity? Oh, if we had one more opportunity, we could do it. Good, I'll give you five more seconds. Go. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Now here's, here, back, Sheba, in your cage, girl. Here's what's happened so far. You came in here. That was your level. They came in here, and you went, well, fiddly D, we're coming in here. Now you know what they're saying, don't you? You gave them a second chance, Tim. Good, I'll give you one more chance. Go. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Now, if we go back over here, they'll hoist a human being or something. I don't know something. And my question is this. Why are we waiting to compete to stand up? Why don't we just stand up? It's America. I mean, I just came back from Saudi Arabia, and please understand, those are the most wonderful people in the whole world, and they have a great educational system, and I ran back here and went, oh my God, and you're Texas. So, want we'll to put your feet flat on the floor for a second? Thank you. How many of you are in this room because of an educator? Let me see, interesting, that looks like 100%. Just for a second, I want you to see that educator's face in your mind that was so influential for you 
that it actually dictated what you're going to do in your life. I want you to see Dr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. See that face of that person that you locked onto and said, I'm going to be like you. I want to do what you do. Good. Would you look up? How many can find somebody? How many can identify somebody? Let me see. I'm interested. How many for you is that person not a part of your immediate life right now? And sometimes that's why we want to just, ah, Dr. So-and-so's not there. You know what? Bet you anything, some of those teachers have done some of the TMEA things that you just saw. Or the teachers who are now administrators like you, Dustin. Now here's what'll happen. Four or five years will go by, and there'll be another collaboration of the arts community. And somebody will go, um, is Tim still around? And go, yeah, he's, you know, he's still tap dancing. So, you know, getting back, let's have him talk to the group. And I'll come back, and at the end I'll say, how many of you are here because of a teacher? And that audience will put their hands up. And I'll say, for just a second, will you see that teacher's face in your mind? Or that administrator's face? Or that leader's face in your mind that was so impactful, it shifted what you do in your life? And the room will get real quiet like it is right now. And many of them will be looking at you. They're looking at you right now. They just want to see how high you're going to reach and how much of a difference you're going to make. And you will make the difference because that's our job. Thanks for a good time. God bless. I appreciate it.